Hey there, welcome to week 2 of building my very first SaaS from absolute zero. But before we jump in guys, I just wanted to let you know that this is members only content. Fortunately for you, the price is just your like below this video. And hey, if you end up not enjoying it, no hard feelings. You can make a refund and take your like back. We're all in the safe space here. Alright, so here is a quick recap of everything that we implemented last week. So we got our system design session, we generated a brand new Spring Boot project with the Java 25, we got our Docker Compose file for Postgres database, we also built the very core feature for our URL generation, stored everything in database and most importantly we took care of the concurrent database queries so we won't have any stale data in there. And finally, we got our redirect controller that allow us to get redirected from short URLs to long ones. And now let's check our plans for this week. So first thing on the list is adding full CRUD support. So my backend would be able to create short links, get them, update or delete them entirely. After that, I'm working on performance. So currently my redirect controller hits database every time and this is not super great. The traffic anticipated is very high there. So I'm gonna add cache layer specifically for this redirect controller. Right after that, I'm uh, improving my short URL creation flow. I want to add a name for created entity and uh, honestly, I would name it title instead. And I want to manually specify the name or get it auto-generated based on the title HTML tag from the past long URL. Then safety wise, I'm adding rate limiter so client won't be able to spam my API and take everything down. Right after that, I'm adding database migration and finally the basic frontend application. Nothing crazy here for now, just adding features so they would match my backend API. All right, so let's get it started. Okay, so three out of six tasks are finished and now I'm gonna go through each of those, show the actual implementation and explain nuances. So first of all, here is our main controller that already has all the necessary operations. So we can create short URLs, we can get redirected. Of course, we can get multiple URLs at once. We can update those and finally we can delete short URL. In this iteration, instead of expecting like a plain string as a query parameter as it was before, now it's a proper request body that we can validate against our requirements so we can check if uh, the name is valid or the long URL is valid and by valid I mean uh, whether the size of each property is not exceeding the set limit. The maximum name length is 2000 characters and the same applies for long URL. So right after we receive our request body I've introduced conversion service here so we convert our DTO which stands for data transfer object so I convert the DTO to the actual entity and before returning response body, I convert it back to DTO object. So keeping this separation between data transfer object and database entity allow us to decouple the API contract and also not expose sensitive information that we might contain in our uh, database entity. For instance, uh, I do not need to expose version. I do not need to expose created timestamp, last updated timestamp. So basically, from the client perspective, it should not know that information. This is essentially what I did is. The next is getting multiple short URLs at once. The best practices is pretty simple. You do not query the entire database and return shitload of entities. Instead of that, you return that in pages. And what I mean by pages is that what you see on almost every website. So this huge list is broke down into smaller pieces called pages and you see those links at the bottom. So if you click on two, the next chunk of the data from database would be loaded and this allows to have faster loading, less mass and easier navigation. Then here goes update. It does the same conversion from DDO to entity, but then I need to make sure that the resource that is passed uh, through the request body is actually 
sure that they're in database. So I fetch that first, I validate if it exists. And only then I do the actual update operation. The last one in this controller is delete. But uh, to explain this one, I need to get back to redirect endpoint and show the change that I introduced. Here I put a cache layer between my controller and database. So here is how it looks like. Imagine the cache is empty. First request goes to database. The entity is saved here. Then it's being returned to controller. And the next time when I receive a request, controller goes straight to cache and fetch the data from there. The cache type I use here is caffeine cache, which is uh, the most popular in memory cache library for Java. So most importantly, I configure the maximum size of uh, each cache bucket. And then I define the expiration after access. So if our entity is constantly accessed from the controller, it's not being expired in cache, and we always have quick access for that. So default maximum size I set here to 1000. I'm not sure if that's enough, but uh, I'm gonna leave it like that for now. And uh, you can ask what's gonna happen if uh, the cache bucket is maxed out with all thousand items. And the way it works is basically Caffeine Cache has a super nice eviction policy. It code least frequently used. In other words, it kicks out items that are accessed not that often. And now if we go back to the delete endpoint. So here first I do the same check whether the resources exist in database. Then I get the short URL key that we use for our cache key, then I evict that from the cache bucket and eventually delete the entity. Also, every time when I shorten URL, I want to give it a title. And for that, I want to either manually enter the title or get that auto generated based on the title HTML tag of the long URL. And this is how it looks like, let's say an example of the same page. So if I get the HTML content and if I look for title, here we go. And I think it would be nice to use something like that as a short URL name on the dashboard. And this is another example why I love software engineering. Everything depends on how far you want to go in the optimization. In this case, let's say you can do a simple get request, find the title tag and forget about it. But if you decide to make it just a little bit more efficient, you can make the same get request, but you specify timeout, then you can specify the maximum size of the response body that you expect. And of course, to not waste your time and the resources, you first of all can validate what the content type of the response, whether it is HTML or JSON or Avro or other content type, and then you find the actual title and uh, get it back. So in my configuration, I set timeout to three seconds and the maximum body that I want to get is 50 kilobytes. All the title tags live uh, within head tag and uh, they placed on the top of the HTML document. And after a brief research, I found out that 50 kilobytes should be fine. So that's that. Additionally, I thought that uh, maybe instead of calling get request right away, I'm I'm gonna call head method, then I validate the content type. And if it's HTML, I'm gonna do the get request and get the title. So why I ended up not doing that? Because um, I realized that some of the servers simply does not implement head method. Also, they might return one set of headers in head method and return completely different in get. And on top of that, that's additional network code that only increases the response time. So at this point, I'm not sure if that's enough in terms of uh, efficiency or security, but we are dealing with one problem at the time. And for all of that, I'm using an ancient library JSOP. Honestly, I haven't used that library even once at my work, but uh, it seems fits perfectly for this purpose. <laughs> All right, so we checked off two more items in our weekly to-do list. And bro, I'm not gonna lie, this was the sweatiest coding session for this project so far. I spent almost the entire day making rate limitation work. And it turned out that the library that I used, which is a bucket 4 j Spring Boot Starter, simply does not support Spring Boot 4 yet. Yeah, that sucks. 
so I had to downgrade my Spring Boot to version 3.5 for now. And the hard truth is that if you're eager to use the brand new major version of Spring Boot and uh, you're using only Spring Boot dependencies, that probably would be fine, but in almost 99% cases you would need some kind of third-party library and that one might don't have compatibility yet. So yeah, sometimes there are some breaking changes and you either wait or adapt your code. All right, so what's with that rate limitation? So I'm using library code bucket4j and there are basically two ways how you can configure rate limitation for your backend. The first one is methods, the one that I currently use and methods meaning you set a rate limiter not based on the URL path, but within the business logic. And here I predefine three policies for rate limitation. The default one that allows 60 calls per minute strict that allows 10 calls per minute and lenient maybe i would increase that but for now it's 1000 and all these three policies work based on the ip of the client so i put rate limiter default policy which is 60 calls per second for every method which communicates with database with uh, one exception which is uh, get by short url here i simply put ignore rate limiting and as i mentioned there is a second way how we can configure your rate limitation this is based on the filters and those filters allow to configure rate limits for each endpoint individually. I realized that the method approach might be not super flexible and I might switch to filter in the future but for now I'm gonna stick to this one and what I can tell right now filters configuration looks way bulkier than this one. Also important thing for me was uh, to keep using caffeine cache. And to achieve that, there is a, some kind of weird construction. Bucket4j doesn't support natively caffeine cache. It uses jcache instead. And here I can tell Spring to use main cache type jcache. And then I do like a bridge between jcache and caffeine cache. And this would enable me to still using caffeine cache for rate limitation buckets. Okay, the next step is database migration. There is a library called Liquibase. It allows to have a consistent uh, state of the database within all the environments that you work in. It stores every single database change that was ever done. You can create tables, you can alter them, you can do data manipulations, do a rollback uh, with Liquibase. So here is, let's say, the first change set that I want to have in my application, which is just a simple creation of the table for short links. And by having this, I can safely go to my entity class and uh, remove all the definitions uh, for length and if it's unique or not. And now we can change data definition language uh, from update, which auto generates tables based on the definition of the entity. We can change that from update to validate. And now Hibernate only validates the state of the entity against the table that already in database. So here I have uh, multiple tables. I'm gonna remove all those. Okay, tables are dropped. I'm gonna restart the application. And we have a lot of logs from Liquibase. So it found the script for create tables that I defined. It ran it. And uh, when I refresh Postgres instance, I have uh, all the defined tables again. And as you can see, there is a database chain log and database change log log. So database change log stores all the information about the scripts that was ran. Who's the author? it takes the name and the author name from this comment and when I run the application again it checks whether it's already in database so it won't recreate table again as for the second table which is database change lock lock the role of that is super simple it prevents multiple instances of your application to run the same script and overwrite the change so if we check what's inside of that currently the change lock one is not locked and that's fine because it's already ran and it won't be run again. The final boss for this week would be connecting my Spring Boot backend to Next.js frontend. And uh, I'm not gonna pretend that I'm a pro in frontend development. I used React.js only briefly in the past. So I'm gonna rely on the vibe coding guts for this one. Here's the plan. I'm thinking of fitting my backend code to LLM, let it analyze my API, 
UI and uh, create a simple UI with the Shatian components. And you know what? It's a great timing because just a couple of days ago, I saw a cool update on Shatian website. They introduced a super awesome way to generate a new project. We can now easily choose component library, theme and colors, icon library, font, even radius. And all of this, to be honest, pretty much reminds me Spring Initializer, where you can choose the exact ingredients for your project, like build tool, language, dependencies, etc. And with all of that, you will have a great starting point where you can focus on your business logic rather than project configuration. And as for the Shatian project, I think I'm gonna go almost with the default configurations for everything, with the one exception, which is radius. I just prefer to have everything a bit more rounded. All right, so our front-end application is up and running, and now I'm gonna let Gemini do its work. Here I came up with a simple prompt for the job. So it should create a minimalistic UI for the URL shortener backend project that integrates with all available REST control endpoints. And from the requirements, I would like to have a light and dark mode switcher. Also, I want to have buttons for create, update and delete operations. And when a user creates or updates the short URL and passes the long URL, which is the original one, at that moment, I want client to call my backend to fetch the title for the long URL and uh, it should be implementing the debouncer call. Basically, if user types or re-enter another URL, the previous call should be cancelled and the current only took into account. Also, I want to have a list with the already created short URLs with all the details. I want that list to be paginated and uh, each entry of that list should contain update and delete action buttons and also there should be a copy to clipboard button so just for the convenience and eventually I suggested uh, to follow do not repeat yourself and uh, keep it simple stupid principles so the project won't have any code duplications and the components won't be over engineered and also I provided a couple of uh, response body samples from my API just to help a bit Gemini to do its job in case it uh, won't interpret DTO objects or it doesn't know the structure of the spring paginated responses. All right, it seems it finished all the tasks. Let's check what we have. So if I go again to localhost, so I have all the URLs fetching and the pagination seems to work. So let's say I want to shorten a new URL. If I enter here, oh nice. I have a suggestion for the title, almost just like I imagine it should be. And the URL was created. And if I copy that clipboard and I go to the URL, Guys, I think we have our first pre-alpha version. All right, what's gonna happen if I want to change the title of this one? Change title, it's updated, but huh, but for some reason it didn't update the state of the stable. Yeah, for some reason it cannot update the short URL, but I think it's just a matter of the proper API integration. So I would say I'm super impressed that Gemini almost one-shotted the task that I assigned to it. Yeah, it looks pretty promising. All right, I think I'm gonna wrap up with this one and I see you guys the next week.